These are data from the former Australian Greenhouse Office up to 2001, so prior to the implementation of uh, some of the new land clearing legislation in Queensland and New South Wales. And uh, you can see the long term average is uh, 468,000 hectares cleared per year. So that puts Australia in the G8, the group of eight uh, top land clearing nations with countries like Brazil, Indonesia, uh, um, Mexico, PNG, Peru, uh, Democratic Republic. Congo. And of course, there are many impacts of land clearing. And it's interesting, I don't know if any of you have read Collapse by Derek Diamond. It's a great read, although long. Uh, but it's, um, uh, he puts, he, he suggests that land clearing is a, a key feature of collapse of uh, societies, historically. Uh, land clearing accounts for around about 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions and around 10% for Australians. Uh, there was a paper published last year by colleagues of mine in uh, Queensland that found that found a very strong link between a reduction in rainfall in eastern Australia and uh, land clearing. And, and, and there are feedbacks from land clearing such as salinity that actually undermine agricultural productivity. Uh, land clearing exceeds afforestation by, in Australia by a ratio of around about 2 to 1. It's interesting, this PEMSEC report, and PEMSEC is the Prime Ministerial Scientific Energy Engineering Innovation Council, something like that, uh, under the previous uh, Howard government, they found, which was led by Steve Morton and had others like Hugh Possingham, so heavy hitters in this area, uh, they, they concluded that the costs of ecological restoration um, uh, exceeded the financial benefits of all scale land clearing. So it was compelling, quite compelling arguments such as these that uh, to let, that led to some pretty major reforms in uh, land clearing in especially Queensland and New South Wales uh, um, uh, earlier in this decade. And, and those reforms uh, have, have attempted to or have sought to put an end to this type of land clearing, broad scale, broad scale clearing. But uh, there's still, there's still demand for land clearing. The legislation hasn't addressed the demand for land clearing, and there's demand for land clearing because it's coupled with economic growth in some respects. And if you, if you think about our, if, if the economy grows at, at the moment, the economy is not growing at this rate, but if the economy grows at 3% per annum, it will double in 25 years. Okay? And uh, before the global financial crisis, that was sort of the target around, you know, a non-unreasonable target. And our agricultural output is set to double in 30 years. And already there's a bit of the global food crisis um, that people talk about, but that's, um, uh, that's one prediction. And our, our population, uh, one prediction is our population will double in 60 years. So the drivers for land clearing are still there. Okay, we've, we've, we've addressed land clearing, of course, our land clearing in, this, in uh, some states in Australia, but it's interesting to note that many of the drivers are still there. And these drivers, uh, it, 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 they're, they're sort of manifest in a few different ways. The, the, the most common application for land clearing in New South Wales in agricultural areas is the, um, the clearing of paddock trees. And uh, it's largely for, the clearing of paddock trees is largely driven by a technology called control traffic farming, which, uh, and the idea behind control traffic farming is that if you remove trees from large cropping areas, you can set up, set up your tractors to go exactly the same place every time. It reduces fuel, it reduces soil compaction, and overall you can have, and it, it, and it means that there's no overlap in any of your inputs into the paddock. So it, it can have, a, you know, um, production benefits of 15%. So that's a, a key land clearing application. Uh, uh, it continues because of the, the need for increasing productivity. Uh, also, despite the fact that we're in a drought and, uh, and we're, we're paying more attention to water use, there's still demand for uh, irrigated agriculture. And uh, irrigated, I just heard um, the Premier of Tasmania this morning talking on radio. I don't know if any of you heard that on Radio National talking about their expanding irrigation. 
uh, in the central part of Tasmania. And of course, there's all the, the talk about moving north to some of our agricultural productivity. And it, irrigation agriculture is obviously very intensive and, and requires a fair bit of clearing, albeit over relatively small areas. And in, in fact, um, <coughs> pivot agriculture is a source of a fair amount of clearing in, um, uh, in uh, Australia for, for those scattered paddock trees. And pivot agriculture is those circles there. Okay, there's, a, there's a, a, an irrigator that goes around with a pivot in the middle. And, and of course, a tree in the way of that doesn't work very well. Uh, another source of clearing that continues in Australia, uh, this is a um, uh, plantation establishment in Tasmania, and although the policy has been changed, under the Regional Forest Agreement in Tasmania, they still clear a lot of, um, currently they still clear a lot of um, native forest to establish plantations. You know, the uh, timber industry is obviously a very important part of the Tasmanian economy. And of course, coastal development. Uh, it's uh, still uh, a significant amount of clearing for coastal and urban development in Australia. And, uh, this, is, um, uh, this is on the Hume Highway in southern New South Wales. So uh, the need for, you know, the push, the demand for a, a dual carriageway all the way between Sydney and Melbourne has meant that um, you know, white box, uh, uh, grassy box woodland such as this is um, is being cleared to allow um, to allow that uh, widening of that highway, and and of course the other one that's come up recently, I, I don't know if any of you saw the seven thirty report uh, not long after the fires, uh, but uh, uh, this family were fined fifty thousand dollars under Victorian legislation for uh, illegally clearing bush around their house, and their house happened to survive fires, and there was a a story in the seven thirty report where they compared this unsaved house among clear bush, and they plucked out a burnt house within within bush and said, therefore, clearing affords protection to your house from wildfire. Now, of course, we all know that that's not a very adequate sample, but um, it's it's got a lot of traction in the media. This and um, uh, and so there's, there's obviously more pressure coming uh, with the uh, impact of for fires on uh, relaxation of land planning laws. All right, so with these continued demands for land clearing, um, offset policy is an attempt to have our cake and eat it. So it's, uh, it's an attempt to allow some continued clearing um, and uh, at the same, while having no net loss of uh, native vegetation or, um, or biodiversity. And I'll say in policy in Australia, it's not an exhaustive list, um, but it's, uh, it's offset, there's, there's offset policies within the South Australian, uh, under the South Australian Native Vegetation Act. Um, uh, there was a national policy in 2001, uh, the net rate of land clearance to zero, and you can read through. Um, uh, several states have an offset policy, I think that's the, the point. And, and the other point, to, to, to glean from this is that most offset policies are within the <coughs> no net loss framework. They're, they're, they're striving to get no net loss or net gain in, um, in biodiversity outcomes or the quality and quantity of um, native vegetation. Now, uh, I, I don't know if any of you guys uh, you know, have been subject to this, but having worked on offset policy before in New South Wales, I've been, uh, you know, I and my colleagues like Sue, we've been under, it's incredible how the 